Hey everybody, BD Dalton here, Growth, Sell, and Retire podcast. I'm here with Mike Thorne, and today we're going to be talking about teams, building trust, and looking at a, <laughs> a fairly weird world when it comes to politics, when it comes to business, and when it comes to getting people together post-COVID. Uh, Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, BD. I really uh, appreciate you having me on. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. It, it, it'll be fun. It's always good. So give us a little bit of your background. I mean, if somebody was to look at your LinkedIn profile, one of the cool things that I always like to have on there is you went to Wharton Business School and, and learned at Wharton, which U.S. is, you know, it's, it's a great business school. We'll have quite a few friends that have been there. So kind of give me your, your work background. And then I've got a couple of questions around Wharton, and then we'll go into the, the beautiful thing about trust and building teams and people around you and rebuilding that trust in which we can hopefully see in the world. Sure. No, I, I was in college and I said the three things I was not going to do from a career standpoint was get into sales, move and travel. And three days before I graduated, I did all three of those things. And that's how I started my career in sales and business development. It was uh, geography of Maryland, DC, Delaware, Northern Virginia. And the, so I spent the first half of my career doing that. And then the second half was spent uh, being offered opportunities to run companies, uh, legacy businesses, companies that had a long-term history that were looking for a reimagination of their business. And unbeknownst to me, people thought I'd add a lot of value in that capacity. And so I became the guy to come in, like the old Mikey cereal commercials back in the day, let Mikey try it. So I'd be the one to go in and say, take this business, Mike, help us not only reimagine the business itself, but how do you take subject matter experts who've known the industry a long time and bring them on the journey? And so I did that in several different industries and found that to be sort of my niche and expertise. And you, some of those industries, so let's walk back through some of the companies because a lot of them are yep. sporting names that a lot of people in the US yep. might know better than the UK, but some of them are European based too. So yep. um, walk us through some of those names because it kind of sets yep. the precedent. Yeah, the first one was Wilson Sporting Goods, which is the official ball of the NBA, the National Basketball Association, the NFL. That was my first seven years of my career. And then I, I was president of Russell Athletic, which was Russell is about a billion five global company. Apparel was the biggest part of their business. And I was involved in running the team sports piece of it, which was selling to professional teams, colleges, and high schools. We had a great team doing that. And then I became president of Yankee Candle, which is in the home fragrance and candle space, completely different industry, another global brand, uh, just an amazing, amazing company and great, great people there. And then I finished up as CEO of a synthetic turf company down in Georgia, which was a complete different industry relative to candles and home fragrance. So what was it, uh, what was it that was similar about those? Because you, you're brought in to solve a problem and issue uh, or, or keep people going or motivating. What, what was a, a similar thread that was amongst all three of those, those last companies? All of them were very well-established brands. All of them started by a family member or individuals. So they were legacy businesses who were facing a different environment and climate economically. So the world was changing, the business competitive set was changing, and they needed someone to come in who could figure out what the future might look like, but at the same time help the people that were the subject matter experts already in the business be able to move with you. So it's one thing to come in and just disrupt everything and you know fire a bunch of people, which doesn't work. So my role was to say, hey, how could you reimagine this business so we can get it growing again? And at the same time, make sure the people that are there can transform and, and uh, build with you. And that was really the challenge all three of those uh, I faced with. Those were, those were big. And the teams that you went into, uh, how, how big were they? Or when you were, the teams that you worked with, not the whole company, but the teams that you actually went in and talked to, how big were they typically, numbers-wise? Well, they're all very different. That's the interesting thing. So the Russell business that I was accountable to was about $110 million business. It was manufacturing. That's the other thing. All three of them were manufacturers. I love manufacturing as an industry. I got to see how footballs got made when I was 21, and I just got really fascinated with manufacturing. So I failed to mention, I, I always loved the manufacturing side of the business. So at, at the Russell Athletic business, it was about $105 million. It was probably... I mean, it was several hundred people, if you include the manufacturing and operations, but directly on the business was probably 100 people. Uh, Yankee Candle, uh, the group I have is about 110 people across all the functions within the organization, obviously global company, but the part I was responsible for. 
And then on the synthetic turf business, about a $45 million business, much smaller. But again, we had manufacturing all told, we had probably 100 employees in the business there. Very cool. And so when you go in, what's when you go into a situation, because a lot of us will be consultants or business owners or somebody, they bring yep. somebody in, what's, what's the first thing you want to look at or the first thing you want to see as outside coming in? I believe the most important thing is to listen. You know, every business has a P&L, the profits and loss, and everybody wants to make sure you're driving the operations and financial performance of the business. The first thing I look for is the other side of the P&O, which is the people and the listening side. And so you've got about 90 days where you have fresh eyes. You don't see things that others are seeing you're fresh to it. After that, you become part of the carpet, as I say, a part of the fabric of the, the business. So I spend a lot of time. Uh, obviously, I try to see if there is some dashboard in the financials. You don't want to lose sight of the operations of financials. But I invest most of my time going around and meeting as many people as I can, all every part of the organization. And I always just ask three simple questions when I do that. I ask, tell me your story. And then I ask them, what do you think the company does really, really well that we should be doing more of? What do you feel like we should be doing less of or just stop doing in total? And then what can I help you with personally and professionally? And when I do that around the company at all levels of the organization, I tend to find the three or four things that are probably top of mind for the people and they're consistent. And the reason I do that is because everybody, when someone new comes in, they're scared to death, they're gonna get fired, things are gonna change, so they're very anxious. And if you can start to take baby steps with some of this stuff, people will start to trust faster, they'll start to get comfortable and realize you're there to help grow the business. A couple examples of that, uh, when I went to uh, Yankee Candle, I uncovered one of the biggest issues were is they didn't have enough ink for the printers. <laughs> now think about this six, $700 million company, my division is about 300 million people were worried about that because they didn't have the authority to actually make a decision that when ink ran out on one printer, they should just order for all of them because at some point in time, they're all gonna run out of ink. And once we gave people the authority to make those decisions, I know this sounds crazy to those that are probably listening, but a little thing like that, uh, at Russell Athletic, we had a major issue in the factory where all of our uh, ink t-shirts were all like smudging and we had issues. It was a massive problem that nobody was addressing. And the young man that was doing the screen printing is just putting down probably in his 20s, making an hourly wage. I asked him those three questions. When I asked him, what can I do for your person professionally? He said, can we go back to the blank ink that we used to use before we made this change? And I said, what do you mean? He said, we made a change to a cheaper ink and it's causing all these downstream problems here if we use the old one. So here's a company doing 110 million in the team division, billion five, we saved $27,000 with this ink that caused hundreds of thousands of dollars getting wasted. And the one guy that knows, nobody was asking him until he answered that question. So it's just trying to understand those things. And once people see the, that you're listening, they will start to rise up and the transformation will start to happen easier, easily, easier, not easily, but easier. When you, when you go in there and you start talking to these guys, how do you, or these people, how do you make sure that they understand that you're, truthful and honest and really want to do it besides tell me this and tell me if your job is worth it and I'm going to cut you if you don't answer the right how do you get over that because you're the new guy coming in yeah some of that is just to uh observe and listen so you're not coming in and making decisions or telling people what's going on you're more listening observing and the other second thing is that you need to be vulnerable yourself and I didn't understand this till I was 40. And that's an area where I have been working on the last 16 years, which is share something about yourself, like share your personal, what you're trying to do, who you are, so people can feel like, okay, this is a human being. He's got a family, wherever you are. So I think the second thing is just sharing you appropriately, obviously, is the other part of this. So people get to know you. So I would say one of the things that you do when you first get in, my experience is that you do speak to the organization, which obviously most companies try to introduce the new leader. And when you're doing that, you start to share a little bit about you personally, not just about I'm a CEO at this company and I know what I'm doing, which is what you hear a lot of. It's like, hey, we're here to fix this thing. I mean, that doesn't go over well. It's just more about you as a human being is really what is powerful, especially in today's climate people looking for authentic leaders and people that care about and have a purpose. And so I think uh, spending some time on that is really crucial as you get introduced. That probably is the best thing to start off when you get introduced. 
And you, you've been inside of companies, and I know you, you work a lot with Vistage and, and CEOs yeah. and, and groups of CEOs, and you hear common, common themes, and you've, you've really come down to it. And I loved it on yours. Let's build a better business world. And I mean, right, right now, we can almost take business out of it, and let's just build a better yeah. world. <laughs> right. It's, right. it's quite hard, but we can only typically do it inside of our businesses or our communities. Right. So what are some of the common problems or issues that people were having that you were able to work together in peer groups because Vistage is a group of five to 10 business owners in a room sharing their problems in a, in a kind of Chatham House rules sort of way. Yeah. What are some of those problems that you are seeing that regularly repeated through your groups over time? Yeah, so Vistage is uh, all non-competing 12 to 16 business owners, small, mid-sized business owners, typically five to hundred million is exceptions, but that's the typical business persona. So they're non-competing. So it feels like it's a safer environment where you can share things. The one thing that stands out all the time is they, people want you to hold them accountable. Like think about that. A CEO holds his whole organization accountable, but nobody holds them accountable. So I would say that was the number one thing that jumped out at me was people really were looking for someone to hold them accountable so they could get things in their business and their own personal life. So they're always working in the business versus on the business is kind of the way to think about it. The second thing is, and I've heard people use different terms for this. I've heard one CEO said, I feel like a fake. I feel like I'm an imposter. I'm not sure I'm really a CEO. I mean, these are literally the words that they're sharing in these meetings about themselves. And it's a lot of the times they don't have access and resources to help them. Like they have either started this business on their own with a par business partner, or they just built it as a family business. They've never been really given an opportunity to find out what other people do and how they go about it because they're so focused in their own business. And the ability to sit in a room with other people and go, oh my God, I didn't know other people had this problem. It may sound simple, but it's really amazing how powerful that can be because you can say, oh my God, it's not just me. So again, feeling like I am an imposter is one. And the second thing is, uh, the, the third thing really is, uh, I always ask this question. I always say to people, the three most powerful words in life are, I love you. And I ask people, how many times you say that? And everybody will go on and tell you that I say, I love you all the time. And then I said, the second question I always ask people is, how many times a day do you say, I need help? You would be astounded how few people feel comfortable asking for help that are in these running small, mid-sized businesses. They don't because they're afraid of being vulnerable. They're afraid of feeling less than or something held them back in their life. So that's the other thing. That's the third thing is that I need to start asking for help. And that's why the Vistage group is a good fit for a lot of people. Peer to peer is, is the way to go. It's We've had so many yeah. successes through our peer to peers over the last four or five years, especially through COVID, especially through trying times, and especially in smaller businesses, the, the half million to the five million. So under the Vistage space, Right, they're, they're even crazier because they are worried about cash flow on a daily basis. So having having those people in there, it's it's great. So that kind of brings us into this your your thoughts around your trust group and in the thought process there. So kind of walk us through what your what your thinking is and what you title it and how we can make it better. So I define it as a personal trust community, which is different than networking. So networking is you reach out to someone to help you get somewhere. And I'm saying to people, as you look at your life, you go from middle school, high school, college, go get a job, go start managing people. You go through this thought process of, do I really belong? Like, that's the biggest thing. Do I belong? And then once you feel like you belong, you start building confidence and then you start to believe you can do it. But every time you make a transformation in your life and then get married, have children, you fall into this, do I belong? Can I be a father? Can I be a husband? Whatever it might be. And if you don't have other people around you that hold you accountable, but also support you along the way, you can really start getting in your head that, that question, am I good enough? Am I a faker? Am I an imposter? And so I have found, because my own experience having been put up for adoption at birth and then being adopted at five months, I struggle with abandonment and trust issues my whole life until I hit 40 years old and met some people that really helped me understand the power of putting a group of people around you. So over the years, I've defined as a personal trust community and it's in essence around five areas of your life. It's simply pies as I referred to it. And the first one is physically, like what are you doing to keep yourself physically active and who do you have in your life that can help you in that regard? Uh, intellectually, 
you know, what are you doing to stimulate your mind? I believe life is a journey of learning. So you always should be learning. So who, it could be someone, you know, directly, or it could be a podcast you listen to or a books you read or whatever, but always who's intellectually stimulating that your trust community, people that you connect with emotionally, especially in today's world, who you work with emotionally and then socially and spiritually. And throughout your life, these people may stay the same. They may change. Some people may fit in more circles than others. Some may just be one. And when you build these people in your community, it's like the trust trampoline. You've got this trampoline and people are in the center bouncing up and down the trampoline, feeling great about themselves, great about the day. But we all have good and bad days. And so in a trampoline, you start falling towards the edge. You could get really hurt. But if you have this trust trampoline that these people around you, they're moving the trampoline to make sure you're always centered. And they hold you accountable if they think you're going off the wrong direction, but they also support you when you're having some bad days. That trust community to me is the most powerful thing any business leader could build as they're starting to build their career. Because as you grow in your career, you're going to need those kind of people around you more and more, family and, and business. And that's something I'm working on. I've created a workbook around it, and I just believe it's simple. There's a way to do it. There's more work we could talk about, but that's the whole idea. Uh, getting at how you build your own, I could talk about that, but that's how I see life. I see a lot of time spent on the business side of it. And businesses spend a lot of time about well, our product, our consumer. It's like, what about you as a human being? You're the leader of this thing. How do you, how do you think about yourself? What are you trying to create for yourself? And I think this is the way to do it. That's cool. The the trampoline idea. So let, let's pretend or pick intellectual or physical yeah you, you get to a spot where first of all how do you choose them the second one and i this was i did this in my book true gravity how do you get rid of them if they're not working anymore without being mean or saying either i no longer need you or i've outgrown that space that you've fulfilled before or how do you move on how do you choose I don't how think, do you move on yeah choosing so there's um I've got in the workbook the actual questions because that comes up an awful lot. It's a great question. And so I would say the first thing to consider is, you know, who are those people that you dream about, get excited about when you want to share a recent experience and where they feel the same way about you? So who are those people would be one? Who is it that you um, want to talk to when you're dealing with something stressful, difficult, or you need a sounding board? Is it a person, a book, or a podcast, right? So who are those people? And then when you want to celebrate something in your life, who do you talk, who do you look to talk to? Like you said, I can't wait to tell someone something, right? Then really important, what are your core values? You know what your core values are because it's just, you got to have people that have alignment with you. And then you start asking yourself across those five pillars, who represents that in your life? So that's the first step. So I'm going to give you an example. My mother, love her dearly in my life, obviously, she said, you know, I never... You didn't grow in my in my body. You grew in my heart because obviously she adopted me, right? Yes. So she's been there, especially at a younger age. There are so many aspects across physically, spiritually, socially, emotionally, intellectually. But as I've gotten older, obviously, I have different experiences. My mother, I don't love her less. I don't care about her less. I don't say you're out of my community. But what she provides me within this trust community changes. So, for example, I recently ran a half Ironman. If I reached out to my mother and just having some trouble with the training or I wasn't feeling good about the work I was doing, the first thing she would say to me was, oh, you shouldn't be doing it. It's too dangerous. You're going to get hurt. Doesn't really help me, right? Hmm. But Susan, Susan Balmer, who's my trainer, Susan would say, Mike, let's talk this through. Let's walk through all this. And she would challenge me, but encourage me at the same time. So I think it's just a shifting like an accordion sometimes, which I don't think people just leave you unless... They have different core values as you get older, which could happen. Sometimes that does happen. And in, in that space, so if you're keeping one or two or three people for your, because I, as you were going through, who would you call? You know, dad came into it. My mentor came into it. My business partner yep. came into it. So it's, it's, there's some good people. How many people should you have holding on to each corner of it, the trampoline? It's because, yep. because you also have to manage and give back to them sometimes. Yes, yeah, yes, you're right. Now, these are the kind of people that drop everything when you reach out to them. It's kind of the way to think about it. I, I don't think it matters. I'll give you, my wife has maybe three, four people in her life, and they are like thickest. They'll do anything for each other, and she has built a real, incredible, solid relationship. I'm very different. I have different needs and different things. So my community is much larger. 
So I think it comes down to you as an individual and the exercise that people go through. I would say just put down a piece of paper, draw a rectangle on the left and draw a rectangle on the right. And on your left, I want you to spend a few minutes thinking about where are you personally and professionally. And you just walk through, write it all down, crayons, pencils, I don't care how you do it. And just get grounded in where you are today. And then go to your right and say, what is your North Star? Like, what are you dreaming about? What do you want to get to? And depending on how big that is or how, you know, how expansive that is may determine how many people you have in your life. Like my wife doesn't need all these people in her life. She likes to keep it very simple, right? To me, I got a lot of things I want to do and I want to be involved in helping people in many ways. So mine's a lot larger of a circle. So there's no one, two or three. I would give you some criteria if that's okay to think about this. Please. Um, you, you want to find people that have competency. Like you don't want to be talking to someone who um, when you're seeking advice, they don't have the competency around the subject matter you're trying to talk about back to like you like your coach, you, you want your, your Ironman coach to have run an Ironman. It's right. Easy. So, yeah. So my mother's great, but again, just, and the second thing is demeanor people that you can relate to. So you feel like when they give you feedback perspectives, you don't take it so personal. They're screaming, yelling, if it doesn't work for you, if it does great, whatever. So make sure you got that demeanor side of it. And then moral characters for me is a real big one. Are these people, you know, they trust that they're grounded and ethical. And then the last one is really more important than people realize, which is awareness. Are these people staying up with what's going on in the world? Are they people that are, you know, thinking back to the way it was 80s, 90s, whatever, because that's not going to be relevant to what's happening in the world today, so to speak, or your business. So think about as you build these people out, those are the other criteria I would say to think about is the competency, the demeanor, the moral character, and the awareness. If you've got that together, I think you can start to figure out who these people are and then work your way towards getting to know them uh, better. And how, how do you interact with them? Or Because I mean, Vistage is a, a group that meets uh, every week, but how, when you're building this thing for yourself, do you engage with them and do they interact with each other? So the way I would do this is I would find the first person. So I did this with a Vistage group the other day. It'd be surprising to people probably how people took the exercise and got emotional. They really, they paused, they choked up and said, I don't know if I really have that kind of person in my life and I feel bad that I don't, or I know who this person is, but I'm not sure how to approach them. It could be one of those two things. So you look for somebody that you have a really powerful relationship with already. You just haven't thought of it in this way. So I'll give you an example. Gentleman said, Mike, I've known uh, my best friend from college for 40 years, four zero years. We have dinner together. We laugh, joke, have a great time together. But as I listen to you talk about these five circles, he is someone intellectually who could help with my business. And so I said, let's talk about that. And he said, I've never asked him to help me, even though he has expertise in this business, even though he's my best friend, even though I've known him for 40 years and we socialize all the time. And the reason is, and this is a very common answer, is I think they're too busy. I'm not sure they have time for me. I don't want to ask for help. Those are the three most common things that people throw back when you go through this exercise. But when someone does broach it, the way to broach it is say, hey, BD, I'm in the process of uh, building my purpose in my life. I need help. Three most powerful words. How many people don't want to help you to say I need help? We donate about $450 billion in this country because people always want to help. And so that's the first one. Find that person you feel most comfortable with, who you also feel like would be most receptive. So you feel a little more comfortable in terms of the risk you're taking. And just reach out to them and say, I need some help. I'm in the process of, I've got a purpose I'm building and I need some help. And see what they say. And more often than not, they're going to say, talk to me, what do you need help on? And you'd be pretty surprised how many people are excited to help you. And then you can probably help them. Very nice. So you went to Wharton. Let's go. And what what was what do you think the the going to a, a big name school? Um, what do you think your your kind of number one takeaway was from just going to something and being around people that are driving themselves forward and at a high intellectual level? Yeah. So I went there because Russell knew that I'd been really a, a sales leader. I'd never run a company with manufacturing. So they felt sending me and believe me, it was three or four weeks at max. I think it was. Yes. But the idea was you'd be around other business leaders, CEOs from all different types of industries and from all around the world. So I would say the one thing I walked away was, wow, it's really great 
to be around people that have very different perspectives, people younger than you, older than you, your age, people from all walks of life, different nationalities. I mean, it was incredible to listen to all the perspectives that could help you be a better leader. But at the same time, you realize it doesn't matter where you are in life, world, industry, a lot of commonalities in terms of the challenges and issues that you're dealing with. Um, but to have other people push you around because they have no agenda, they're not trying to compete with you, was really cool and powerful. And I won't forget that. That's cool. Being in a spot yeah. where you don't have competition, but everybody wants to have the same goal, which is better outcomes for businesses in general. That's right, right. Fabulous. So you, you've you've turned over a new leaf and you're you're moving forward. I mean, you're doing your Vistage stuff and doing that. Um, what's helping you right now? technology wise to make your life either more fun or easier in your business and new new life working world? Well, ironically, Zoom and LinkedIn have been two places that have been simple stuff. I'm not a big, I don't like complexity, I like simplicity. So I'm probably gonna disappoint some people here. There's not some revolutionary technology I have, but just whether it's Zoom or Teams, whatever it might be, the ability to connect to people at any time, any place in the world, one of the chairs that I've got a relationship with lives in Malta. Like, what are the chances I could ever have a relationship if we couldn't connect this way through this vehicle? And then LinkedIn is a great place because you can just talk about whatever is important to you and what you want to share with the world. And then people can choose to either be engaged with it or not. And what I like about it is it's not like if people don't want to be engaged, so be it. They don't have to listen, don't have to join, don't have to connect with you, or whatever, right? But I think it's really cool to find people. Uh, I always believe that once you declare where you're going in life, people just show up. And so I'm declaring where I'm going with the work I'm doing. It's much more purposeful. I had a friend of mine several years ago say, Mike, are you doing what you need to do? Or are you doing what you want to do? And his point to me was you're a very purpose-driven person, yet you're doing work, Mike, because you're trying to get a good salary and a title. In reality, that's not who you are. And so now that I'm sharing my beliefs, some people agree, some people don't. I find LinkedIn is a great place because people can make a choice. They can opt in or opt out, right? So those right now have been the best for me uh, at this point in time. Very cool. And now what are you reading or listening to, you know, audiobook or whatever it is that, that's either inspiring you or making you do new things? Yeah. So it's a guy named Jay Shetty. I think he's the number one health podcast in the world. And Jay is just, I just love listening. He was a former monk and he talks about ways to you know, improve your mental health and all that. But Jay Shetty's podcast on uh, Spotify is what I listen to all the time. He's got great, great content. So I'm a very big fan of his. And um, Brene Brown is the other one. I've re read her books. I really feel like she has a good sense and very science-based sense of this idea of what it means to be worthy and dignity and all this. She's really well grounded in that. So I learn a lot from the work she does. The other one that's local, but I believe it has a tremendous amount of relevance and is an interesting company is Kevin Hancock, owns Hancock Lumber, the CEO, is a seventh generation leader of his business. Back during the financial crisis, Kevin uh, lost his voice, literally uh, had a disease come on. He couldn't even speak. So he went from being a very much a dem just demonstrative leader to not being able to have his voice. He went out to uh, Indian reservation, met some people and realized they had no voice. And he's come back uh, to the US. He's written a book, I think it's called, yeah, it's called The Seventh Power. It's uh, one CEO's journey into the business of shared leadership. And his whole idea is this thing of uh, socially transformative work culture in which employee engagement is uh, soars because everyone feels like they're authentically heard. And if you look at his business results from the day they started working on this over the last seven, eight years, it's gone like this. And so Kevin's actually implementing what I believe is, which is letting your people have a voice in the business and be authentic. And I have this mission that uh, restoring people's human dignity will elevate people. And I think that's where Kevin is doing a great job of that. I had coffee with him recently, I reached out to him and said, I'd love to chat with you. And so he's someone that I think has demonstrated how this actually works in the real world on a very legacy driven business, been around over a hundred years of lumber building materials and he's doing it. So those, and then most recently I started reading uh, Jeff Bezos new book just cause I'm fascinated. He's adopted. So I have a connection that way, but he's a fascinating guy and how they've built the, uh, the, the company over the years. Very, very interesting uh, guy. 
And then the lady who ran uh, Pepsi, she just re retired recently, Indra. She's just an amazing uh, lady. And just reading how she really took that company from one that cared about just a product, she brought health into the equation. I think those are some interesting leaders that I'm fascinated to read their new books I just came out with. Very cool. What's what's the place that we can find out more about Mike Thorne? Where, where can we go to find out more about you and, and the teachings that you've put out there? Yep. Uh, the website is mikethorne.co. Perfect. Simple, we'll, Mike Thorne we'll, put it, we'll put it in the show notes and it should be fairly yeah. easy. And they can follow you on LinkedIn or find you on LinkedIn too. At Mike yep. Thorne. Yep. Yep. On the yep. Yeah, there's a, I'm working on a book that'll come out in June and there's some other work I'm doing. We're just starting this journey in the last year or so. So I'm excited about where we're going. It'll be fun. So we call yeah. this the rewind minute or the golden moment or the red ticket. So what is, if somebody gets to the end of this and they get this spot right here, what's your one thing that you could tell them that'll make them rewind and listen to the whole thing and the whole interview with Mike Thorne? Yeah, I want them to ask themselves a simple question. What is it you're trying to create for yourself personally? What are you trying to create for yourself? If you don't know or you're curious what that means, I think if you listen to the uh, podcast, you'd be able to pick up on that. But that's it. What are you trying to create for yourself? Mike Thorne, that was awesome. Thank you so much for coming on Grow, Sell, and Retire. It's been an honor to have you on here and sharing information and thoughts around making it a trust community, which is really cool. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, not, you're welcome. I appreciate having me on there. Thank you.